In the treatment tier, we will try to sum up many of the important aspects discussed throughout the module and relate them to the proper treatment for the proper disease. However, antibiotics can have an entire course to themselves, and they will be given that in a section of pharmacology. It may also be difficult to remember the seemingly arbitrary treatments that do and do not work for certain bacteria, and these treatments change as antibiotic resistance grows. In later modules, we will cover in more depth the mechanisms of action and common resistances that are seen in bacteria. Most of what physicians need to know is what drug to use and what potential side effects it may cause. Let's leave the mechanisms of action up to pharmacy for now. We will also try to give some useful tips when deciphering which drug to use when a patient has something common, as many common diseases can be caused by a multitude of pathogens, including viral, parasitic, and fungal microbe. For this module, let's just keep it simple. Like micro, pharmacology is a language of its own. It will take some practice to gain familiarity with the terms, and saying the drugs out loud a few times can help you if this is your first time encountering them. Antibiotics can most generally be categorized by their broad function, cell wall inhibitors, cell synthesis inhibitors, protein inhibitors, and miscellaneous. The cell wall inhibitors include the penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and monobactams. These antibiotics specifically bind to different proteins in the bacterial cell wall and inhibit growth. Penicillins and cephalosporins are versatile, each having several generations or categories of new antibiotics. They are easily spotted for having the psyllin suffix or ceph prefix, respectively. There are about 20 in each class that you should have a general familiarity with. However, unless you're planning on going in infectious disease specialties, it's unlikely that you'll need to master the several drugs that make up each of the generations of each antibiotic. Each generation within each class has a slight variation in specialization against certain bacteria, so it doesn't hurt to know this as well. The carbapenems are much less confusing, consisting of only a few commonly used medications. This class has broad coverage for many organisms. The monobactam class consists of one drug, astrionam. Unfortunately, it also has no gram-positive coverage, making it more limited in scope than the others. Pens and cefs, being the earlier to be discovered and thus widely used, have the most resistance towards them. Many microbes have found methods to efflux the drug out of themselves or have shared enzymes between different species that help them break down antibiotics. This is why beta-lactamase inhibitors are commonly used in conjunction with penicillins and other beta-lactam antibiotics. We should also add one more classification to this section, the non-beta-lactams. Beta-lactamase inhibitors and the glycopeptide antibiotic vancomycin fit into this category. One other, the cyclic lipopeptide daptomycin, would best be placed here as well. The drug classes they belong to is not very high yield, but when to use them is. As multi-drug resistance has become a more prevalent problem, newer ways to combat adaptive microbes are needed. The beta-lactamase inhibitors were created when the bacteria, especially gram-positives and anaerobes, began to show mutations of a new enzyme that would break down beta-lactam. Not all gram-positives and anaerobes are resistant to beta-lactams, so they still have a place in modern medicine. However, with certain bacteria, it is safer to add the beta-lactamase inhibitors to a beta-lactam treatment. One common one is amoxicillin clavulinate, which adds clavulinic acid to penicillin. Vancomycin is useful in the beta-lactam resistance and multi-drug resistant microbes, but only has gram-positive coverage. It has a lot of side effects as well. Daptomycin has been used in some vanco-resistant infections, but is also limited to gram-positive coverage. It is inactivated by surfactant in the respiratory tract, making it less effective in respiratory diseases. Now to look specifically at the treatments that are currently suggested for gram-positive cocci. Let's begin with the Staphylococcus genus. Staph aureus, as we saw in the disease tier, is a pretty common pathogen. Whenever you see the presentation of impetigo or another skin or soft tissue infection, this should be registering as a strong possibility. Once you have a certain diagnosis of Staph aureus, one thing you need to decide is if it's penicillin sensitive or if it's MRSA. If sensitive, using a regular penicillin is fine. If MRSA, you will need something a little more directed towards a resistant strain. Currently, the most commonly used is vancomycin. There are a lot of possible side effects with vanco, and overuse of this is causing resistance to this drug as well. Up to 90% of staph epi is predicted to already be methicillin resistant, prompting a known infection with this staph to be treated directly with vanco. 
Some of the levels of resistance are attributed to overuse of antibiotics for other infections. As Steph Epi is already on the skin, those bacteria that survive the treatment of other diseases are naturally going to become more resistant. Their biofilms also decrease antibiotic effectiveness. For any UTI, the treatment of choice is either TMP, SMX, or ciprofloxacin. However, since cipro, trimethoprim, and sulfoclast drugs are all known teratogens, any pregnant patient should instead be put on nitroferritone. Most of the strep species are less resistant to conservative treatments. They seem to be less promiscuous than their fellow gram-positive cocci cousins. In fact, all of the strep species, minus enterococcus, is still sensitive to penicillin-class antibiotics. You are less likely to see a question regarding treatment of these. If you do, they may ask you the odd one out, enterococcus. This one is not only resistant to pens, but most are resistant to vanco as well. The next drug in the lineup is lenezolid. Don't confuse effectiveness with strength. Vanco is not necessarily stronger than a penicillin, and lenezolid not stronger than vanco. It just has to do with the order in which they are discovered, overused, and how fast we can come up with a new drug before the new resistance strains kill us all. Another way they may try to trip you up on an exam question would be if the patient is penicillin allergic then you may want to consider another line of treatment. It used to be assumed that penicillin allergies had a large chance of a patient having a similar or cross reaction with cephs, but the percentage now is thought to be much lower. It may be safe to treat with a cephalosporin if the patient has a penicillin allergy, though it's preferred to initially keep them under hospital supervision. In the next module, more specifics about gram-positive bacillus will be explored. In the next video in this tier, we will cover the other major classifications of antibiotics, as well as those specific medications you will need to remember to treat gram-positive rods. If you appreciate the material we are creating, the best form of flattery is sharing it with your friends. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and bookmark our website as we continue to create and gather more resources for your use.